Welcome, everybody. Happy uh, Thursday evening. Is it Thursday? It's Thursday. I think it's Thursday. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Matt Steinmetz. I'm the Patron Training and Technology Coordinator with the Lexington County Public Library System. Uh, with me tonight is Claudia Smith Brinson. She is the author of Stories of Struggle. Uh, it's a book about the clash over civil rights in South Carolina. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I've got everybody's cameras turned off and everybody's microphones turned off who's in attendance, but if you want to ask questions, you can click. There's a little question mark that you should see on your screen. If you click on that, you can type in questions that I can pass along to Miss Brinson and then uh, she can answer them. Uh, and I'd also like to mention that copies of her book are available to purchase from the South Carolina State Museum from Odd Bird Books and from the Historic Columbia Foundation. And I think the uh, autograph copies are at Odd Bird Books and Historic Columbia, is that right? That's right. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so thanks for joining us. Uh, again, if you got any questions, put them in the chat and I will watch that. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Claudia Smith Brinson worked as a journalist at newspapers in Greece. Florida and South Carolina for more than 30 years. Uh, the majority of her career with Knight Ritter as a senior writer, national writing coach and columnist and associate editor for the editorial page of the state newspaper in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, in 2006, she joined Columbia College in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, directing the writing for print and digital media major and an internship program and holding the Harriet Gray Blackwell Endowed Professorship. Uh, she won more than three dozen state, regional, and national awards for her journalism, was the first person to win uh, Knight Ritter's Award of Excellence twice, and was a member of the state newspaper team whose work on Hurricane Hugo uh, was a Pulitzer finalist. She has published essays in women's magazines, and her short fiction awards include the O. Henry Award given for Einstein's Daughter, as well as recognition by the National League of Penn Women and Iowa Women Literary Journal. So. Yeah, thanks for being with us, Ms. Brinson. It is a pleasure to have you. I've enjoyed talking to you beforehand and the couple little discussions that we've had. Um, but this is a, an important book and a serious topic and of conversation, something that we have to talk or should talk about. Um, but I'll let you get our conversation started. If there's anything you'd like to preface with saying about the book. Yeah, I'll, I'll describe the book to you briefly, and then we're going to talk about um, some portions of the book that that might be familiar to you because they're somewhat local. So uh, as a journalist, I um, often found myself talking to elderly black civil rights activists and I wanted to preserve their stories and I knew their stories were not known because the version of South Carolina as a moderate state during the civil rights movement did not match at all the um, stories of the black activists I met. So I started interviewing them whenever I could. Uh, a lot of these people were born in the 1890s, um, and I knew that they would be gone soon and we would lose their stories. Um, their stories had not been told for a variety of reasons. One was that South Carolina was very effective in um, creating an image for itself. People are often surprised um, when I say South Carolina was very violent. They said, what about Mississippi and Alabama? And my quick answer there is that when you think of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, um, which is well known not just because of the violence, but because of Senator John Lewis, there were, this was the beginning of the TV era and there were cameras there. And so that was broadcast. Um, in South Carolina, in the little towns, there were not TV cameras. So we're not as familiar with the images of the violence that took place in South Carolina. But for example, um, in several of the cities that had historically black colleges and universities, dogs, fire hoses, and tear gas were used against the students. Um, so as I explored this, um, I got more and more interested. And I think of myself not just as a journalist, but a storyteller. And I wanted to preserve these stories. And I knew they would be lost, not just because they hadn't been told before, and not just because the people were elderly, but because a lot of these stories were very difficult to tell. And many of these activists had not told their own families. They just were too sad, too disturbing, um, something that had been tucked away. And so um, 
noble examples of people who t believed completely in what the Constitution promised in terms of their citizenship rights um, were not going to be celebrated, and that just felt wrong to me. So that's how the book started, and it became a quest for me to continue to find people. And journalists know if you find one, you can find a hundred. You know, one person leads to another person. So the story, uh, the stories became the organizing principle for the book. It is not a traditional history book in terms of marching through a couple of decades of event after event. It's grouped around the people. So um, the main chapters are about Briggs versus Elliott, which was the first lawsuit in Brown versus the Board of Education. Brown versus Board of Education is most often described by legal authorities as the most important Supreme Court decision of the Supreme Court's history. It ended legal segregation, declared it unconstitutional um, in public schools, and it began in Somerton, South Carolina. The story of Brown has been told frequently, not necessarily the story of Briggs, and it's been told in terms of the great men, and I wanted to tell it um, through the petitioners. And the people of Somerton who signed the petitions, the original petition had more than 100 children and adults, were persecuted um, physically, shots were fired into their home, there were death threats, there was arson, there was murder, um, there were attempted murders, um, and they persevered. There was more than one petition and they kept signing. So they're very inspiring people. Um, another major chapter is on the sit-ins, and I take it historically back college and university town by town. So Columbia, of course, has Allen and Benedict. Um, Sumter has Morris College, then Mork has Voorhees. Ver Orangeburg has Claflin and SC State. I wanted you to get to know the students, so we go through the events in that town for 1960, and then we go to another town. And I should mention here that um, some of the student leaders went on to play important roles nationally just as Briggs versus Valiant became very nationally important. Thomas Gaither was a core field secretary after he graduated from Claflin, that's the Congress of Racial Equality, um, and it was the key um, instrument in training students in nonviolent direct action. He, on a bus ride, um, came up with Gordon Carey uh, with the Freedom Rides. He was the one to push the idea in 1961 of jail no bail. The students in 1960 were getting arrested, um, getting bailed out by the NAACP or Corps because it was extremely dangerous to stay in jails. They could get beaten up, they could get killed, sexual assaults. Um, so they would get out as almost as quickly as they got booked um, through bail money and they decided that they were gonna stay in. The estatement was important enough for them to take those risks and that they didn't want to be paying the system for their protest. In other words, you know, paying the bail and bond. Um, the NAACP wasn't too happy with this because uh, the NAACP wanted to pursue lawsuits and CORE wanted to make a point. And I'll talk a little more about that when we talk about sit-ins. The last major chapter is about the hospital strike that was in 1969. It's considered by many to be the last big civil rights event of the civil rights era. 400 women who worked at Medical College Hospital and the College of Charleston Hospital um, went on strike. They uh, had labor union support. There was a um, burgeoning um, labor union for hospital strike workers. That union, 1199, was deeply connected to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King. And when Ralph Abernathy tried to step into Martin Luther King's shoes. He saw this as an, um, a possibility to further the um, poor people's campaign that Martin Luther King had started. And so those two groups, powerful and influential great men, um, came in to help these 400 women who were picketing and marching on the streets with their children. Um, Governor McNair sent down armed guards, uh, armed soldiers, excuse me, with uh, rifles, with bayonets and tanks um, to deal with these dangerous women. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were striking um, because they were not paid a minimum wage. They did not, more importantly, feel that they had human dignity. Um, they were freely called names. They were asked to do tasks it was illegal for them to do. They did not have a cafeteria. They did not have appropriate restrooms. It was 1969. There had been 64 and 65 Civil Rights Acts, and they were still practicing segregation in these schools. And by the way, um, the hospitals had been in trouble with the federal government, um, which had been threatening sanctions since 65, but hadn't acted. And I must say that, you know, when you talk about states' rights, lots of times um, 
the right constitutional things happen, happen because of federal money. South Carolina did not fully segregate until the 70s. Um, that was because of a lawsuit in Greenville, but also the potential loss of federal money. Uh, the hospital strike, the administrators finally agreed um, to some of the aims of the women because the federal money was going to get lost. And in, in both cases, this is millions of dollars. There are two other chapters on leaders. Um, Reverend um, James Miles Hinton, that I'm going to talk about in, in a second, and Reverend Cecil Augustus Ivory. They were both uniquely um, placed in their moment in time and with their personalities, which were very different to lead movements. Um, Reverend Hinton was an articulate, ferociously eloquent person who didn't back down ever. And Reverend Cecil Augustus Ivory was a charming man that uh, white people were really comfortable with and then uncomfortable with what he wanted, which was equality. He was also wheelchair bound. Um, he managed to connect the NAACP core and the students, which other people couldn't do, into a very strong student movement in Rock Hill. So we're going to start with um, Reverend Hinton. And awesome. We have a yeah, photo of him. Yeah, let me pull that up. So I this is Reverend James Miles Hinton. I did not get to meet him, but I talked to his children and to um, some of his friends. He was born, like I said, in the late 1890s, orphaned young, at four years old, um, brought up by an aunt in New York City, attended a Bible training school, and then entered World War I. There were only a few hundred um, black men who served in World War I as officers. He was one of them. Um, he mustered out in Augusta, Georgia, and Augusta had Pilgrim Life and Health Insurance Company at that point in time, which was a black-owned insurance company, and it hired him. Um, and he went from um, being a, an important salesperson to by the end of his life being um, chair of the board for Pilgrim. He succeeded at everything he did. In 1938-39, he settled in Columbia, although he worked in Augusta where the headquarters was. Um, and he had his family in Columbia and he became first the um, president of the local NAACP, the Columbia NAACP and then um, the head of the state conference. And under his guidance, uh, what had been just the beginnings of the NAACP in South Carolina had something like 80 chapters and tens of thousands of members um, because he was such a hard worker. He was one of those people who slept very little and had many irons in the fire uh, at all times and managed to handle them all beautifully. Because of him, in the 1940s, South Carolina had lawsuits for teacher equal pay, for voting rights, um, for um, acceptance to uh, law schools, and for uh, Briggs versus Elliott. Won them all. And part of the reasons they won them was they were not just good, strong cases, but Reverend Hinton was there to foster the petitioners, to uh, protect and encourage the petitioners, and his brilliance was recognized by the National NAACP and Thurgood Marshall, who was often the person who was um, defending the petitioners in these cases, or excuse me, prosecuting the issues. So one of the um, important ones besides Briggs was Elmore B. Rice. And South Carolina had the very last white-only primary. The Democratic Party was dominant then, and uh, they just wouldn't register black people to vote. And um, for the rare person who was registered, they'd stop them in their tracks when they were trying to vote him. And it was very important that the primary, uh, the primary is very important because it was the dominant party. So if you couldn't vote in the primary, you really didn't have a vote. And Hinton talked all the time about what he called first class citizenship rights. And he made a fiery speech one time um, during World War II where his son was off fighting in World War II. And he said, my son might lose his life on the battlefields of Europe, and yet he cannot vote in hellish South Carolina. Um, he would say most anything at a time where it was rather dangerous to do so. So, so he had tried for several years to get people to register. And at that point in time, the registration books would be in like little stores. And uh, they were across the street from a store, they being a group of about five men, including Hinton, waiting to see um, the registration book pulled out for a white person, and then they were going to dash across the street and say, we want to register too. Um, and 
one by one they had tried this and it hadn't worked so they were going to try the dash and they were not feeling very good about this because this had been tried in previous years and had not been successful george elmore showed up he um owned a business that was on um gervais street he had a five and dime store he was a real entrepreneur he also did photography and he ran a taxi company and he was very loquacious um just a chatty kind of guy and he said let me go over there and he uh, identified as black, but you would not have uh, identified him yourself perhaps as a black man. And when he went over, that's exactly what happened. He was thought to be white. Uh, she pulled out the book, the registrar. Um, she instructed him in writing his name, Elmore, and then they got to the address and he wrote down his address, which was Waverly, the Allen and Benedict neighborhood, recognizable as a black neighborhood. And she said, well, you're a damn, and you can fill in the word there. And um, she said, go ahead and sign. Uh, I, mean, you, I mean, go ahead, go ahead and excuse me and invite your friends over and let them sign too. You've signed, I might as well. So that's how five people in Columbia got to register to vote. Um, when Elmore went to vote though, he was turned down and that became the lawsuit that ended the white primary. Um, South Carolina tried um, after it was told that it had to open the primary. Um, it tried again to block voters by requiring a segregation oath. You had to take an oath before you could vote that you believed in the separation of the races in all manner and form. And um, so uh, David uh, Baskin, yeah, Brown in um, Beaufort uh, refused to sign the oath and he sued again. And South Carolina defended its choice this way. It said, uh, we're a private club, the Democratic Party, just like Forest Lake Country Club, which is here in Columbia and still open. And we can deny membership to anybody we want. Well, the federal judge didn't buy that. So that was Reverend Hinton. So uh, Reverend Hinton um, was president from 41 to 58. He retired then. Uh, he was a Baptist preacher. He was preaching uh, along on, sun on Sundays in his, quote, uh, free time. <laughs> and um, as he moved off, off the scene, so in some ways did the NAACP. So let's see the next picture, Matt. This is the White Citizens Council. And after Brown v. Board um, in 54 and 55, uh, white citizens in the Deep South and Mississippi first, and then very quickly in South Carolina through an attorney that was um, on the South Carolina side and Briggs v. Elliott formed what were called white citizens councils. And they were sometimes called the KKK in business suits and ties. Um, they practice um, all sorts of uh, pressures. They denied the Briggs petitioners access to farm machinery, to uh, feed and seed. Um, people in, who were members of the white citizens council would pick a petitioner to persecute um, in Briggs v. Elliott, Harry and Eliza were the two first signatories with their children. Um, Harry was fired on Christmas Eve, given a pack of cigarettes and told because he was a petitioner, he no longer had a job. His wife, Eliza, worked at a local um, motel. She was fired from her job as a housekeeper, sought a job at a second motel, which did hire her, but only briefly because the motel owner told, him that, told her that he would be sanctioned and would lose access to city water if he didn't fire her. So these people in this picture, and if you look over to the far side where you see a dark object hanging down, that's a Confederate flag, um, are all people who are willing to do these kinds of things, who are willing to deny people clothes, food, um, a livelihood, uh, because they are unhappy with their effort to have citizenship rights, the right to uh, equal schooling, the right to vote. and um, I didn't provide you this picture, but on the stage were um, Strom Thurmond, um, uh, Senator Eastland, Saul Blatt, all the dignitaries you can imagine um, from the South and from South Carolina. So um, the NAACP uh, really struggled with the pressure of both the KKK and the WCC. And in 1956, the South Carolina legislature forbade, it passed a law for, for, and it forbade people to be employed by city, county, or school district or the state if they belong to the NAACP. And so uh, what happened was there were lots of groups that were called citizen groups.
and the NAACP in the state accepted that people would belong to the citizen groups rather than the NAACP so they could keep working. So next picture. This is David Carter and Robert DeVoe. They were cousins and they were World War II veterans. And this is 1960 and their leaders in the first sit-ins marched um, I can't remember, it's the second, third, and fourth, or the third and fourth. Um, the first sit-ins in Colombia. The uh, sit-ins that caught fire uh, began February 1st in 1960 in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I say caught fire because CORE and the NAACP have been trying out citizens, uh, in trying out sit-ins since the 1940s. So I wanted you to see these, these two young men. They are both um, going um, to graduate school. Um, they're both uh, interested in theology. They're both World War II veterans. In fact, David Carter, who's the one in the sunglasses with the long overcoat on, had boxed for the military. And so they've gone off and risked their lives for their country in World War II, and they've come back and been told they can't walk into the for, for, front door of a restaurant, they can't sit at a lunch counter, um, they may, maybe they can't vote, um, that their children are going to be in schools that are not adequately funded um, because, as I mentioned, um, South Carolina was resisting Brown v. Board of Education. So in, in the minds of a lot of these World War II veterans is I was willing to give my life for democracy, and I come back and democracy doesn't want me. And so um, World War II veterans were important in the movement, um, not only because of their glimpse of another life, they were treated as liberators often, um, but because when they came back, they were persecuted. There are many instances, including in South Carolina, a soldier who was blinded, Isaac Woodard, of um, men being attacked because they were in their uniforms. And the idea among many white people was they didn't want white, uh, black soldiers because they didn't want people trained in warfare and people with access to guns who were black. So instead of being grateful to the black soldiers, they often were persecuted in violent ways. So Carter and DeVoe were organizing sit-ins. Um, I mentioned that the NWCP was kind of fading here. The students were impatient with the NAACP. Um, they had seen with their parents from the 40s through the 60s uh, that it took a very long time. Um, Briggs versus Elliott started with a request in 1946 for a bus. The decisions were 54 and 55. Desegregation is still way in the future. Um, George V. Elmore took a couple of years. Uh, I could, well, I could just rattle on. All these lawsuits took time in court. Um, another part of this was these students had seen moments where their parents embarrassed them when they were younger, where their parents, because of caution and fear and perhaps habit, had um, been uh, willing to bow their heads or go to the back door or say yes sir in a very uncomfortable situation and had made the children feel bad and then explained to them afterwards why it was necessary. Um, but these young people, they said, we don't, we don't buy that. We, we want more and we want, we want to have a better life than our parents. And so we're gonna pursue it in a different way. So can we see the next picture? This is some of the hundreds of kids that came downtown. So they met at Benedict and Allen. There were about 500 of them on the first day that met, and about two to 300 came downtown. They quietly walked down the streets um, from Benedict and Allen downtown. It's a little over a mile um, to Main Street. They went in and out of stores. A few stayed um, toward the end of lunch hour to sit at lunch counters. When they were asked to leave, they did that. So um, as you can see, they're all very well dressed. Some of them have in their hands either their school books or their Bibles. And their goal, if they got a lunch counter seat, was to sit and quietly read until it was necessary to go. Um, on these two days, no one was arrested, but there were arrests pretty quickly after that. So next picture. The man that you see is blocking um, what would be the colored, it was called the colored entrance. And this building you might be familiar with, it's behind Tapp's department store. It was the Greyhound Bus Depot. 
Um, you'll see a larger crowd at the front where there was the whites only entrance. And this is one of the places besides the lunch counters that the students um, stage to sit in. And so if we go to the next picture, Matt, we can see them sitting. So here they are. You can see that they're quiet, they're sedate, um, and when they were asked to leave, um, they left. So nonviolent direct action was what these students were pursuing. Um, nonviolent direct action came um, first from India and from the uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation who um, were people who were pacifists, who had been conscientious objectors. And out of that group, which formed in England and then came to the US, um, the Congress of Racial Equality was formed. Um, it was a biracial group that started in Chicago. And uh, James T. McCain, who was a Sumter resident, became its first black Southern-based field secretary. And he was going up and down the East Coast training students in nonviolent direct action. And so when you were trained, you would get in a group and you would, the uh, Satyagraha, which was uh, Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence would be taught to you. And the way it would be taught was it would be explained that this was love power and that you are a human being with dignity and within your dignity, you needed to reside and when people confronted you with violence, your goal was to look them in the eyes with love. Now think about that. Think about all the times someone has said something to you and you've gotten angry instantly. So you, you're learning to control your own angry response and look at this person with love. And of course, um, the people that were going to attack these students in their next sit-ins were violent, cigarettes were burned out on their backs, they were pushed off stools, ammonia was thrown at them deliberately to you know, damage their eyesight. Um, there were extreme responses to these students, um, but they were successful in their nonviolence. Um, I cannot find um, instances um, in Colombia or the other cities that I followed in 1960 of students responding with violence. They would um, leave, as I said, um, or they would be arrested and forced to leave, but they didn't push back, they didn't hit back, they didn't carry weapons. They were, they were instructed not to even carry a fingernail file when they went on these, um, these marches. So, next picture. Um, in 1961, I'm gonna go back uh, in a minute, but I wanna give you an example. In 1961, Lenny Glover, who's another World War II veteran, was sitting in this store, Woolworth, downtown in Columbia, with David Carter. They were practicing their own two-person sit-in. A white man walked up, stabbed Lenny Glover, and walked out without anybody stopping him. Glover um, did not know how badly he was wounded. Carter got up to immediately search for the police. Glover had a car and drove himself to the Waverly Hospital, more than a mile away in the Waverly neighborhood. And when he got there, he almost fled to death because he was stabbed in the spleen and they thought on the operating table that he might not survive. So this sign, as you can see, says the blood of Lenny Glover is in this store, beware. And that's how he responded. He just went right back out peacefully uh, with his sign to remind people of what the response was um, to this. So I'm gonna read you, um, when the arrest started. This is March 11th. I'm going to read you just a few paragraphs about um, Simon Bowie uh, of Allen and uh, uh, a guy named Neil of Benedict. On Friday, March 11th, students held sit-ins without arrest. And on Monday, March 14th, Neil of Benedict and Bowie of Allen entered Eckerd Drug Store on Main Street, the store whose employees they found most prejudiced. The 20-year-old students were part of a large group but ended up alone inside. We thought we were going in on Moss, said Bowie. We walked in because we were the leaders, so we walked in and they remained on the outside, which was wise. But we weren't aware of that until we got all the way to the back. Bowie, the song We Shall Overcome in his head, thought, y'all get to overcome and I get to go to jail. The two persevered. When we got to the counter, there were seats available and we took our seats. White patrons at the other end of the counter stood rather than sit with them. A waitress told them they couldn't be served and had to leave. The manager told them, y'all get out of here. 
Customers began banging their knives and forks on the counter. When the two refused to leave, the manager asked for the police, then told Neil and Bowie, the law will put you all out, according to Bowie. We prayed, said Bowie. I was scared as hell, all the white people looking at you with hatred. People sitting there got up. While Neil carried in his pocket typewritten instructions on carrying out nonviolent citizens, I don't know why I keep flubbing on that word. Uh, Neil carried in his pocket typewritten instructions on carrying out a nonviolent sit-in. Said Bowie, we were told this is a nonviolent effort. Above anything, don't create violence. Don't beat nobody. Don't jump on nobody. Just do what you're supposed to do. Go in there, sit down, and let them do what they're supposed to do. Assistant Police Chief S.A. Griffith arrived, and when Bowie said the two would not relinquish their seats, ordered them removed. The six-foot-tall Griffith lifted Bowie by his collar and jacket as he marched him to the store's front door. I tried to get away. I didn't weigh but 125 pounds, said Bowie. Secretly, though, he was glad to go. Oh, free at last, he thought. I would rather die outside than die in here. Neil and Bowie were charged with breach of peace. Bowie's objection to being marched roughly to the waiting police car and then shoved in led to the additional charge of resisting arrest. Reverend Ida Quincy Newman, who was by this time the field secretary for the NAACP, was really all behind it in a skillful way, according to Bowie, but was not available to bail them out. Instead, Reverend Bowman came to the rescue. This is William McKinley Bowman, who owned a radio station in town. Bowie could hear Bowman telling officials, these boys, we don't know what got into them. We've been good in the white community. We've been peaceful. Released on a $200 bond, Bowie was sympathetic to what he thought of as Bowman's old school apologetic approach. He felt nothing but gratitude since Bowman had obtained their release. Bowie went from jail to his job at a Lady Street barbershop. He attended work as if nothing had happened, but the television news came on and there he was being hustled into a police car. A white customer told the barber, that boy up there in that picture looks just like that shine boy. The barber replied, oh no, he's been here all day long as Bowie kept his head down. Um, I should have said that it's Talmadge Neal, uh, that's his full name. Um, so the NAACP, as I said, wanted people to be charged, um, be in jail, get bailed out, and then they would um, sue. Um, they would go to court and say that they had been arrested unfairly. The students were most often arrested for trespass and for breach of peace. Of course, if I, as I've explained it to you, um, there are people who could buy in the store, so why couldn't they sit? And there were people who were being peaceful, so they certainly weren't breaching um, the peace, except maybe, as you could see, the, the peace of mind of white segregationists in the store. Um, at, in Colombia, there were far fewer sit-ins than in other cities because the students were so closely affiliated with the NAACP, which didn't want to just sort of a touch here and there of a reminder of the sit-ins without um, constant sit-ins like there were in some of the other um, cities. Um, Reverend Bowman was using a technique when he was apologetic. His goal was to get the students out. And um, uh, I think people would misunderstand this sometimes, an uh, in enormous danger. Sometimes what you had to do was um, be softer spoken and smaller physically um, to not risk the lives of other people. And that's what he was doing there and Bowie understood that. Um, the Moving Image Research Collection at USC has video of uh, Reverend Bowie, he became a minister, being arrested. And so when I would do my research, I was I was talking to the activists. I was at the time when I started working on this book, cranking my way through microfilm <laughs> to read newspapers day by day by day um, in the periods when I knew these events were happening. Now you can you know look digitally, but I wasn't doing that initially. And um, I also was looking at other archives like um, Merck that I just mentioned. Um, Library of Congress um, has, and so does this, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, have oral histories um, of some of these uh, activists that were taken, of course, years later, but still exist. So there are a variety of ways that I did the research, and I would sort of think of it as a triangle. I'd be talking to a person, I'd be looking for documents, maybe they had letters. Um, James T. McCain, who was the core field secretary, um, he had calendars where he would, and so did Reverend Newman, where they would write going to Orangeburg today for a protest. Um, James T. McCain has going to Sumter to look for freedom writers. It's thrilling to see, see these notes in their handwriting. 
And um, so I'm talking to people, I'm looking at um, newspapers, black owned and white owned, and I'm looking at archives and other people's oral histories and bringing that all together for the fullest picture um, that I can make. So that might lead us, Matt, into why I love libraries. <laughs> That's fantastic. Before we, we jump onto that, I, I wanted to put it out there too to all of our attendees. If you've got any questions, again, click on that question box. And if you submit it to me, I will pass it along. And I, I had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask. Um, chapter one is Fearless Leader. And it's about, yeah, James Miles Hinton Sr. Um, and, and was he attacked personally, physically? Um, he was attacked three times by the KKK. Um, the first time was after he was new in his office, and this was in the um, late 40s, I think. Um, he was at a meeting, and um, Reverend Adams' daughter, Charity, who later became one of the first female black um, colonels in the military, called to say the KKK are here. And her father and Hinton went home to Waverly, where the KKK was massing on their streets. Um, and everybody was armed back then. Um, what happened was um, through phone calls and from people noticing what was going on, all the neighbors got on their roofs with their guns and um, called the police. The police said, oh, well, they're just out in the street. There's nothing we can do. And so they stayed um, through the day, through the night, and into the morning. Um, guarding Reverend Hinton and Reverend Adams, and in the morning, the KKK gave up and left. Um, another uh, time, they shot into his house. He was not home. He was in Augusta. His wife was home. Luckily, she was upstairs because the shotgun blast tore through the front uh, walls of their house and embedded themselves into the plaster, um, broke some furniture that was in the front um, foyer of their house. Um, the most important one I should mention is that uh, what they called night riders would um, abduct people and beat them sometimes to death. And this happened to, to um, Reverend Hinton. He was in Augusta, there was a knock on the door. His, his landlady said, someone says they've, um, someone has hit your car. He was in his pajamas, he put on his robe, his slippers, he went to the door and as soon as he got to the door, he was grabbed by a white man, forced um, into a car, um, held um, on the floor of the car by the feet of several white men and driven into the woods um, outside of Augusta. Um, and I had, he was very reticent about describing what happened to him, understandably, but he did write a letter to Thurgood Marshall and he did tell neighbors about what happened and his neighbors saw how battered he was. So evidently he was tied to a tree. They put their car headlights on so they could see him. They were beating him. There was uh, one man said, uh, you're the James Hinton who wants to put black kids into the College of Charleston. And he said, yes, I am. And they said, well, don't you know you can't do that? But their car radios were on and they heard um, both a neighbor, a white neighbor and his landlady had called the police. Black ministers were out looking the police were out looking and all that was on the radio broadcast. And so they decided it was too dangerous to keep attacking him. And so they untied him, told him not to leave until the cars were gone. He immediately, of course, followed the cars out um, and, and then finally flagged down a bus as he was trudging um, down a road and got back. And he had a sense of humor, even about something like that. He said, uh, he had a whole posse of preachers out there ready to rescue him, and it was good for their immortal souls that they didn't find the scene. So um, he said he would, uh, I find this a memorable thing to think about, he would rather die than live on his knees. And so the very next day, he was at work again. A few days after that, he was at a banquet um, at, the, at the NAACP where he, he made that statement. Um, he just didn't even take a little break. And and he was fairly well versed in the Constitution and and studied it himself and could discuss it at length with others. It's one of the interesting things about this is that most of the black uh, elders that I talked to knew the Constitution far better than most of us do now. And certainly yeah. their opponents did then. And um, Reverend Hinton, 
would write letters to the editor. Um, he would um, write to senators and congressmen and to the U.S. Justice Department, and he always knew what he was talking about. And um, uh, he knew that the 14th Amendment uh, guarantees that you cannot take the rights of citizens, states cannot take the rights of citizens, for example. 14th Amendment became very um, powerful in a lot of these lawsuits. He knew that and he used that. Um, and as I said before, he talked about being a first class citizen, which had to do with the vote. Um, he believed quite accurately, if you can't vote, you're not a full citizen in this, in this country. Yeah. Well, you, you briefly mentioned libraries and, and their role for you. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. I, I grew up, my, both of my parents were professors. One taught uh, at the Divinity School at Duke and one taught English at, at Meredith College up in Raleigh. Um, so I was lucky enough to grow up in a house where we had a, a sort of in-house, in-home library. And most of the books were, <laughs> when I was younger, were pretty, pretty far beyond my scope but um you know they they sort of weren't in a lot of ways because my parents didn't limit me in what i had access to so i found myself reading above um my pay grade so to speak um and reading things that i i um they probably wouldn't have given me um the, the school wouldn't have given me or, or wouldn't have assumed that i would have been um able to read and, and because of that i think i had a pretty good reading comprehension level. My my spelling was atrocious, but I, I was reading, you know, I was reading a lot of these authors. The, my mom taught classical English, and I I read a lot of you know translations of Chaucer maybe when I was in middle school. And oh my the, yeah, that's not the things that most middle schoolers are are reading at the time, just because it was sitting at, in the library that was you know part of my bedroom. But um, I know libraries have played an important role for you. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, before I, I mention me, I want to mention that um, in most southern towns, there was no access to the library for black citizens. Um, the schools uh, uh, for black children were often hunting lodges or um, abandoned cabins that um, black families had um, used for their children. They off, most often did not have heat. They did not have water. And the books were the discards from the white schools. And you couldn't go to the library. So when I talk about um, these activists who are so well versed um, and eloquent, they're self educated people. They have done everything they can in their power to get an education. They have not been assisted by the state or the federal government in those years. So I was assisted by the federal government. I was a military brat. <laughs> um, my dad was an Air Force information officer, and I lived something like 16 places by the time I was 23. He had itchy feet. And um, I remember every library um, at every base. So, uh, one of my um, most memorable was in Japan. It was in a Quonset hut. And imagine a tin can that's been cut vertically in half, and half of it's been placed, um, so the empty part is the ground. That's a Quonset hut, not very attractive. Cement floor, tin ceiling, um, and shelf after shelf after shelf. And so I would read, like you, uh, Matt, anything I could get my hands on. So I, I know all about Tarzan, because yeah, that was right. the place of Tarzan. <laughs> I know that Tarzan went to Mars. Did you know right? that? Yeah. <laughs> But my father, I'm, I'm not quite sure what he was doing in the military, except he had gone into World War II. He had been a navigator and a bombardier and had come back to South Carolina to finish his education. And I wanted to marry my mother and I think went back into the military because that's what he knew. But he was not a macho man. He was an intellectual, soft-spoken, arty kind of guy. And I was the firstborn. He was reading tales of Shakespeare by the Lamb's brother and sister to me. Um, we were listening to classical music and conducting. He, he was giving me a great education as just a, a little tiny kid. Um, my mother says that when I went to kindergarten on the first day at nap time, I marched up to the teacher and I said, I don't want a nap. When are we going to learn something? <laughs> so that was my attitude. And so I always had a bookcase 
I always had um, the ability to go to the library, and like you, I read beyond my years. Um, I read Dostoevsky, for example, way too young, too upsetting, you know. Um, I have reread some of those books since then because I think it was important to read them, you know, when they're in your sphere of experience. Um, but libraries were a safe and happy place for me. Um, I was moving all the time, so I didn't have other adults to seek sanctuary with, and I had sort of a crazy family. And so um, books were a place where I could learn um, about good and smart and adventuresome people um, in the safety of my room with a cat. And um, I could uh, then excel at school because I was, I, yeah. I knew my stuff, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And I was lucky in that, that I had that access to literature to fill up my life and my head in um, very positive ways. There's that sort of, there's a, that interesting intersection of public libraries and, and uh, black history in, in South Carolina, the, who was the, the uh, challenger astronaut, the McNair mm -hmm. in Lake City being kicked out of the public library there back in, in 59. And then he, uh, you know, they named the library, I believe, after him, or there, there's a plaque up outside of it that's memorializing him. But that's 1959, and he was, it still had the segregated public library. Mary Wren Wright Elliman um, of the Children's Defense, Defense Fund, the founder, um, grew up in Bennettsville and had no access to the library. And she and her so sister Olive now have a library named after them. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to me how hard some people, um, surely had to work to prepare themselves for the yep. extraordinary things that they did later in life. And um, it's, I think, shameful to think that they were being denied um, schooling and something as wonderful as a library as a, as a means to that greater world. Right. And, and I'm looking at your, uh, in the back of the book, there's a, a great index back here and then your bibliography goes on for pages and, um, yeah, so did you use um, did you use Richland Library and University of South Carolina? I think you said you got some of the images from, from Richland Library, is that right? Yeah, Richland Public Library um, uh, purchased the photograph archives of the state newspaper. Um, many newspapers are throwing away their film. Um, and I think this is a, a tragedy that uh, that these records are, are gone. And photographs were very useful to me. Um, for example, I know some things about Reverend Hinton, not just from hearing people talk about him, but from looking at those strong eyes in that picture. Um, so uh, that those the Richland Library photographs were important to me. And um, Margaret Dunlap and Debbie Bloom in the local history center would help me out um, occasionally. South Carolina Library, um, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, an archival library at the University of South Carolina, has a lot of pictures. Um, and Beth Bilderback and Graham Duncan um, there were very helpful to me and Henry Fulmer. When I was first doing archive research, this is not something you're trained to do as a reporter, right? You're out there on the streets and you're in meetings and things like that. And I would come in and I had, you know, gone through their their list of what they have, and I would ask them about James T. McCain, and they would find out what I was interested in, and halfway through whatever I was reading, they would come over with a present. They would come over with somebody else's when everything was still in boxes. They'd come yeah. over with a box, and they'd say, yeah. I think you ought to look at this, too. So, so librarians were wonderful guides to me in helping me learn how to find the things that I needed to find that had been left behind by some of these wonderful people. Yeah, Debbie, Debbie Blue over originally, the sh big shout out to her. Um, I'll, I'll, she's a neighbor of mine, and she definitely knows the, her way around the, the Richland local history um, section that they have over there. Um, you want to talk a little bit about your, your writerly intentions with Stories of Struggle, um, your goals and what, you're, what you were trying to do um, in writing this book? Okay. So... Um when I came to South Carolina, um, I I had noticed in my own growing up, I'm, you know, I, I was not growing up in a segregated society um, because the military had been desegregated by Harry Truman in um, late 1949. Um, 
I, but I was very much growing up in um, male dominated society. So, I, and I was growing up in different cultures. I mentioned that I was outside the continental US for several years of, of my childhood. So uh, some of the things that happen to you, I, th I think, and I'm, I'm using the you in general here, is that when you're exposed to a lot of different cultures, you start understanding that different is just different. It's not automatically bad, which is what right. some people think. Yeah. Um, and I think also um, learning the history of other people and seeing how they operated um, and thinking about that and reading gave me a sense of um, fairness and, and justice as well as this sense of the diversity and uh, diversity is something interesting rather than something negative. And so when I came to South Carolina, one of the first things I noticed that I thought was rather odd was this thank God for Mississippi slogan, which was uh, the idea that South Carolina was 47 or 48 or 49, not 50. And I thought about that a lot. I was an education reporter at first. Um, and so I was seeing, you know, that the schools were still not as strong as they should be, that they weren't funded in the way they, that they really should be. And I was also seeing this sort of cavalier attitude toward um, poverty. And, you know, it's just, it's just basic that if, if you lift all boats, you lift all boats and, and it, it profits all people. And so I was, pu I was puzzled some by the, this approach and, also, the racism that was built in that, um, and you know, statistically, African Americans were about a third of the population then. But because there were more white people, there were more white people poor. So, so it was even in the racism, it was it was rather odd. So I talked the newspaper into letting me write about poverty for five years, and that was that was eye opening. Obviously, um, one of the things I did was I replicated. Um, Senator Hollings' hunger tour, which got a lot of attention. He went down into the low country um, where people had third world diseases from hunger. Right. I went back to some of those same people in the same circumstances um, almost 20 years later. So, so these things are, are in my mind as um, I'm deciding um, that I actually, through these interviews, am probably c collecting material for a book. And as a reporter, people were always saying, oh, you should write a book. But I was a single parent um, most of my children's childhood. Um, I was not only um, working as a journalist, but I was teaching at USC one course a year. I had a little business um, helping business people and lawyers improve their writing. I was trying to make a living and um, spend time with my children. And I would think, yeah, that'll be nice at some point. <laughs> But then somewhere along the way, um, as I said, this quest began, which is that I can't let these stories go. I can't let these people um, leave this planet without people knowing about them. And I, I felt very deeply that I, I, um, Reverend Hinton was not being written about and people need to know him. And I hope at some point someone writes a book about him because he's a beautiful writer himself. His papers are, are available. Um, James T. McCain. He he's one of the reasons that 1960 was nonviolent because he was teaching it and he came from Sumter, yeah. South Carolina, and he's the closest thing um, I have ever met to a saint. He is a good he was a, I, mean, I didn't meet him several times. He's a good I, man. I do and, have a question from a viewer. Um, Melissa had a question for you. Uh, she wanted to know, have more South Carolinians shown warmer reception to the stories you share in your talks and in Stories for Struggle following the prominence of media coverage of current civil rights stories today? I don't know. I don't, you know, the book's only been out since November 23rd. So, um, of course, we're talking more about race right now, and it's, and it's very important that we are. Um, I'm not a, a black history scholar. Um, I'm not a black activist. I'm um, someone who is collecting stories and passing them on. And so it's a different kind of book um, from a lot of the books that are um, being discussed right now. But I hope that people like the difference in that um, these are such good people and you should know them. You should know them. And I have done my utmost to to preserve and convey their stories as they would like. Most, most of the time, if, if people were still alive or if um, their relatives had provided me information, I would, um, whenever possible, go over the information with them, you know, to assure accuracy. 
It's, so um, I'm hoping that um, people will be receptive to these stories, but I don't know if they will or not. There was there was a follow up to how how can we make sure stories continue being shared to preserve our, our full history? Yeah, um, one of the reasons you know that these stories are not well known is um, what I think of as propaganda that um, South Carolina worked very hard as, as um, governors were as eloquently segregationist as anyone else in the Deep South. Um, uh, James Brown said, we will always be uh, uh, white, white, there will always be white supremacy in South Carolina, for example. Um, uh, and Hollings and, uh, would use World War II metaphors um, like Churchill did. He would say, we're gonna defend the hedgerows. And he's talking about black citizens. So the, that's the reason that these stories aren't well known. So what do you do about that? Um, I think uh, wonderful programs can be happening in schools where children interview their relatives, white or black. And um, I think a lot of uh, older white people um, would probably be uncomfortable with these stories for a variety of reasons. They've got a relative who was pursuing white supremacy, or on the other hand, they didn't know it and they feel kind of uncomfortable about not knowing it. Why didn't they know it? Because their parents protected them or because what, what we call now white privilege protected them. Um, for many black families, as I mentioned, um, sometimes these stories weren't passed on because they're too distressing. But I, I, I wanna mention quickly that when I started working on Briggs, I talked to Somerton High School and I, uh, the high school there is still majority black. It's something like 97, 98% um, African-American and a few Latinos and maybe one or two white people um, most years. And so I got with the newspaper there and um, I recruited some journalists at the state newspaper and we went down and trained the newspaper staff there to go out and interview their relatives and uh, other people in town that might have had some connection with Briggs versus Elliott. And one of my favorite experiences there was there was one guy that was just sort of like, oh, I'm not sure I'm really interested in this, you know. <laughs> and when we, we came back a couple of times and when we were going to look at their final stories and help them edit them when they thought they had them ready, I was working with him and he had this great stories about his grandfather. And I said, these are so good. How did you get them? And he said, well, some of them I heard before, but before I didn't listen. <laughs> yeah. He said, yeah. this time I listened. Um, yeah. And later on, when I was teaching at USC, I taught an honors course where um, students went over into Waverly to do oral histories. Yeah. Um, and um, there was a student named Eli who, um, he, he was sort of casual, he was very smart and sort of casual. He sort of made A's without doing any work. And he told me that he, he said, you know, I just sort of skim over the material and um, then I get a test and, you know, I've got like a 98 and I don't even read the comments about why I lost the two points because I don't really care. He said, and I can't remember who he interviewed, but it was, it was an elderly lady. He said, but when I talked to Miss so-and-so, it was her life. Right. right. It was history and it was her life. This is really important. <laughs> yeah. Keep those is. family, keep those family letters. Keep keep those, you know, make that recording of your grandmother, of your of your parents who who has these stories in their head. Um, that they're important. We got about one minute left, and I didn't know if there was anything you wanted to say to to wrap it up. Um, if there's anything you want to conclude with. Well, I'm hoping you're interested in the book. Um, I think it will give you an insight into um, not only the past, but the heroism that uh, many people, I, I struggle with how to describe this. I, I'm trying to say recently, ordinary people who became extraordinary. In other words, people you pass on the street every day who became noble heroes in pursuing democratic rights and changed the United States of America for the better. And um, so these are inspiring stories. And um, I think you might feel better about the world and be motivated to do something yourself um, once we struggle our way out of this you know, confinement that we're in now. And um, so I do think uh, 
Uh, maybe it's um, self-promoting, but I do think it's an important book in, in the preservation it's, of stories. It's, and it's I important. I hope some of you will be interested in it. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Again, we've got, there's copies that are available to purchase um, right now from South Carolina State Museum, Old Bird Books, and the Historic Columbia Foundation, as well as through Barnes & Noble and from Amazon. Um, yeah. So I really want to thank you for being here um, and sharing your, your story about writing this book with us and sharing their stories and, and putting it um, in a place that's accessible um, and that will be preserved. Um, yeah, I want to thank all of our attendees for coming. Um, hopefully we can do this again, but it will be in person. Um, yeah, so with that, I'm going to close out the session. I want to say thank you, Matt, another wonderful librarian. Oh, librarian. Thank you, I appreciate it. You're, I can't tell under these lights, but you're making me blush. Um, so anyways, I really appreciate our attendees for being here. Thank you, Ms. Brinson, for being here. Let's do it again soon. And with that, I'm going to close out our session tonight. Thank you. Bye.